All right. Welcome back to the show, Dandies. And today we have a very dandy episode. Uh, We have Salome Buzzard on, and she is a clothing and jewelry designer, an anarchist, and a political fashion blogger for Anti-Fascist Fashionist X. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the show description, just in case you forget. Uh, So obviously my channel is called Cyber Dandy. And being an American, uh, I've gotten used to the fact that people don't know what a dandy even is, let alone what it could possibly be if you're a cyber dandy. Um, And so I've struggled to wrap my head around the concept well enough to explain it. And the reason why that's been a struggle for me is because I didn't really deeply consider it. Um... When I started using the handle, I actually, Aragorn, uh, who some of you may or may not know or have heard of, started calling me a dandy. And um, I happen to have some familiarity with that from Albert Camus' book, The Rebel, uh, which has sort of been a bit of like a guidebook to all sorts of rebellious currents throughout my life. Um, so I know of the concept from that, a little bit of web searches, but I really didn't think I was the person to explain this. And I happened to, uh, know exactly the right person for that. So hi, Selma. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you? Doing, doing well. Uh, and so up on the screen, I have a picture of a dandy. It's actually the cover of a copy of, um, Arabois that I have mm-hmm. by, Heisman. Uh, I don't know the actual painting though, (laughs) but whatever. (laughs) So where should we begin? Uh, So, okay. How about where does, where does this concept of the dandy come from? Um, The dandy proper emerges in the early 19th century with Beau Brummel, but it has roots that go beyond that that come earlier um it it really starts to emerge with the fashion of macaroni which uh i I endorse just in in all senses very pro macaroni um both as a, a style and a food um it was initially just an insulting term to describe uh passionate sentimental uh androgynous individuals and it has a really interesting specifically like uh anglo root um it was it fundamentally describes anything that's anti-english in the 18th century um it was meant to communicate ideas of uh decadence uh possible homosexuality effeminacy um things that we might assert today as a queer identity and actually there's a quote from peter mcneil says uh, some macaronis may have utilized aspects of high fashion in order to affect new class identities, but others may have asserted what we would now label a queer identity. This was an aesthetic and a behavior or a, a, a mode of being uh, that was typified by uh, lace, frills, satin, silks, velvets, excessively tall wigs, maybe a little hat that could only be removed from uh, the top of the wig with a sword. Um, and it's, uh, it's not very different. Uh, macaroniism is not very different from how we see dandies defined in later periods and even new romantics, uh, up in the eighties. Um, Joseph Twadwell Shipley in 1770 describes the macaroni as there is indeed a kind of animal, neither male nor female, a thing of the neuter gender gender, lately started up among us. It is called a macaroni. It talks without meaning. It smiles without pleasantry. It eats without appetite. It rides without exercise. It wenches without passion. I think the lack of passion and and, uh, without appetite is an interesting qualifier because every other resource that I've been able to locate uh, describes the macaroni as something as, you know, fanning and fainting and foppishness. Um, but all of these things, including the uh, without meaning and without passion, the nonchalance that this is meant to convey, you definitely see roots of that 
uh, as uh, dandyism progresses in the early 19th century with Beau Brummel. Um, and it was very much communicated uh, through the, you know, through the conceit of Britishness of, oh, that's a little Italian, that's a little French. And then in the Enlightenment period, you start to see, oh, that's a little American colonial. Um, Yankee Doodle Dandy is sort of like the American song. But uh, when it was used by the British to the colonists, uh, it implied this sort of dressing up as, you know, bourgeois or aristocratic without really understanding what it meant and also still being effeminate and unmanly. So associating sophistication and masculinity and dressing down quite literally the colonists who could not afford such things and were playing at it and st uh, sticking a single feather in your, uh, your crappy hat was enough to make you this cosmopolitan dude. Um, it, uh, it then became reclaimed, you know, as slurs so often are, uh, uh, into this tune of, oh no, that's definitely ours. We are indeed the macaroni. We are indeed Yankee Doodle Dandy. We are very fancy. We are very manly and we are going to be America. We are no longer uh, colonies. We're going to do to indigenous peoples what you did to us because it is our divine right. Um, and after the Battle of Lexington and Concord in 1775, uh, Soldiers in the British Army asked each other, how, how do you like the song Yankee Doodle now that you're losing, now that we are losing? And uh, one of them said, you know, damn them. They made us dance till we were tired and it sounded less sweet to our ears. So once it could no longer be leveled as a pejorative um, in this very aggressively, you know, hegemonic masculine battle of nations, um, it, its meaning then shifted again. It looks like you were going to say something. So, yeah. Um, so, okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting a little confused on, uh, I guess I, I, I always associated it with the French and probably because I read a lot of mm -hmm. this in Camus book, mm -hmm. but um, you're, you're saying there's actually more of a British and American um meaning for for the term right kind of um in general where i come from with the britishness is uh it, it was the british critique of these behaviors that they associated with the french and the italian the passions the uh frivolities the the bourgeois excess um in both fashion and behavior uh whereas you know britain saw themselves as more sober the stiff upper lip um so it was a uh, to call somebody a dandy or a macaroni was very much to say, you're not very British. And to those that kind of adopted that, you know, that mode of being, uh, that, that style, that, uh, that attitude for lack of a better word, uh, it was like, well, that's kind of the point. <laughs> um, but a lot of the writing on dandyism, especially, uh, because it comes through, a, the uh, Yankee Doodle pejorative uh, jingle, and Bo Brummel, like the arbiter of dandy fashion, because he was British. And then moving into Oscar Wilde and others, that Anglo-Irish lens does sort of become uh, the one through which a lot of this is viewed. Uh, so whether as a critique or an aspiration, um, y yes, it is it's kind of through that lens that we have most of our resources, but, uh, but you're also correct. It's absolutely Frenchified when that is a bad thing. I see. So we'll get to some of the uh, standout characters in the history in a bit, yeah. but you know, part of what has made this a confusing history for me is that uh, as Camus writes about it, he basically, he has a whole chapter on dandyism, but all he talks about is the French romantics like mm -hmm. Baudelaire and Heisman I mentioned earlier and uh, poets like that, La Tremont. And um, I don't, so I, I've heard 
from you <laughs> that this is not actually correct. And uh, there is a distinction between romanticism and the dandy dandyism. There is. And I mean, it's not surprising that Camus looks at it through the French lens. Um, the French romantic poets that you named uh, were absolutely key players. Uh, dandyism starts much earlier than that. And I hope that. Uh, so going back, uh, Bo Brummel is considered the dandy. Uh, he was born in June of 1778. It's not shocking that he was a Gemini. <laughs> uh, and he first kind of made his mark on fashion when he was at Eton. And he was like, well, you know, the breeches that we wear and uh, all of these uh, very French clothing or Fre French style, this heavy, heavy brocades and this, that and the other. That's definitely a look, but, and uh, he started wearing a really elaborate white cravat. He started wearing gold buckles. Uh, he started wearing very fitted long trousers instead of the knee breeches and a much shorter, uh, a much shorter coat. And this was considered not just beautiful, elegant and modern, but also fairly shocking. Um, you couldn't, you suddenly couldn't see what kind of stockings a man had on, and it was much more heavily tailored. Um, he joined the military around the age of 16, and uh, because he was in the 10th Royal Hussars, that's the personal regiment of the Prince of Wales, um, his look, his mode was so eye-catching and so different that the Prince of Wales was like, I gotta know this guy. Um uh, and by sheer force of personality, aesthetic, and aloofness, his nonchalance was, um, he was, according to a junior officer, allowed to misparade, shirk his essence, and, uh, or shirk his duties, and uh, do just as he pleased, which I think really is a great uh, foundational philosophy of Tandyism. And I will expand on that uh, through the 19th century up to the present day, but just this utterly flamboyant individualism, pleasure for pleasure's sake, in spite of some of the things that Brummel himself would articulate, really hits to the center of the dandy. It's like, well, what do I enjoy and how do I look good doing it? Um, he was asked how much it would take to keep a single man in clothes, and he was said to have replied, why, with tolerable economy, I think it might be done for 800 pounds. And this was in, you know, 1800, so adjusting for uh, currency changes and inflation, uh, that today amounts to 118,794 British pounds. Uh, when the average working person's salary was uh, 52 pounds a year. <laughs> um, so, you know, he was said to have uh, washed his or polished his boots in uh, champagne. Um, he, he was uh, characterized by a preoccupation with dress, a nonchalant display of wit. And again, these sort of bon mots, those are very much the attitude of the dandy, like, I'm not just going to look amazing. I'm not just going to modernize the aesthetic. I'm going to do it in such a way with a performative carelessness that I will be catnip to anybody who matters. And I think in present dandyism, even in to the later 19th century, that very much shifted. But this was Beau Brummel. This was his, uh, this was his personal habit. This was his style. Um, and it, it got him friends, you know, he was, uh, the style guide of the era. The Prince of Wales was, uh, was one of his subscribers, if you will. He was sort of the, one of the first influencers. And I, I hate to use that term because I hate everything that that culture, uh, stands for on the internet, but it, it was what he was. He was an influencer. Um, he made it to the top of the heap and, this is where uh, the title of the uh, discussion comes in, New Shabby and Insane. Um, a confirmed bachelor throughout his life, but at some point he did contract what appeared to be syphilis. 
Um, so not much is known about his personal life beyond his friendships with notable people, beyond his uh, facade as, well, that may, may not be true. Um, I was not able to find very much, I should say, on his personal lives beyond th those he influenced in style. Um, but he did contract syphilis. And as he's spending time with these upper echelons, he's spending more lavishly on not just clothes, but also uh, recreation. He became Uh, with a few other well-known individuals, uh, in, uh, including the Prince of Wales. Um, very much famous for being famous. Like, he was one of the original famous for being famous personalities. Uh, but he wasn't apparently as good a gambler as he was an arbiter of fashion. And he fled to France uh, in the early 1800s, around 1816. Um, he owed about 600,000 pounds. Again, that's in 19th century currency. So uh, that's based on those rates. That's several million today. He did not have that money. He was an unemployed former soldier who hung out with rich people. He was not rich. Um, but by 1840, he had uh, run out of money. He could not afford the fancy cravats and champagne shoe polish and the ravages of tertiary syphilis <laughs> untreated. Um, left him dying, shabby and insane, uh, in uh, a French asylum in 1840. And that sort of seems like a sort of poetic, not justice, because there's really, there's just no criticism here of him. Just, huh, all right, yeah, no, that seems like the way that that story would end. That's uh, very Hogarth of you. Um, uh, ties into uh, some, some other things that I'm going to get into, but in his own words, to be truly elegant, one should not be noticed. But this was also said by the man who went to extraordinary lengths and underwent multitudinous extravagances to be noticed by the people he wanted to notice him. Um, I really appreciate how that kind of uh, plants the seed of the inherent irony and the attitude of what I've uh, learned about dandyism and just, oh yeah, no, this is true. But it's also not um, fetch me my Italian silk chamois. I need a servant to polish my my knuckle or something. I, I, I there's a special place in my heart for this asshole. Yeah. Well, so there's a couple of things you touched on, but one is uh, so to start off with. I kind of want to paint the picture of the way that the upper class is dressed at the time because you mentioned. Mm -hmm. The breeches were no longer uh, dandyism and Beau Brummel is what got uh, people away from breeches. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is the cravat. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you read up on the history of cravats in general, but they're yeah. like a lot of other garments that became uh, fashionable. It comes from the military. And mm -hmm. so um, just to quickly say uh, basically the history of neck scarves and neck attire in general is a very military oriented history. And that makes so sense. it makes sense that Bo Brummel would have some relationship with the military, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Just if you could real quick paint the picture of what uh, people were wearing at the time. Okay. Uh, this was the Georgian era in uh, the British monarchy. This was the Regency era. So we're still coming out of the the 18th century uh, long-tailed waistcoats. Um, not for nothing were British soldiers referred to as lobsters. They had those massive red coats that were short and fitted at the front, but they had the long, long red tails. That made them look like boiled lobsters. Um, the tricorn hat is still uh, is still a style uh, item for. Definitely the military and most members of the upper class um, powdered wigs are in fashion. He was very much uh, a bit of a a bit of a renegade in that he wore his hair natural and uh, a la brute uh, style of Brutus, sort of shaggy, but cropped short, no wig. Um, you know, powdered wigs, the little bows and the pigtails in the hair. Um, in, in uh, France and Italian courts and there 
emulators. You've got maybe painted on beauty marks, um, uh, knee, uh, knee breeches, boots, buckled shoes, uh, everything that we think of when we think of like the revolutionary war aesthetic. Um, we think of, you know, pirates of the Caribbean, um, that general era of fashion. So he really moved away from what was considered just, no, this is just what men wear. Uh, and in many ways, uh, from his definition of masculinity, from uh, the moment that he became the acme of fashion, very little has changed since. The tailored suit is still considered luxe, is still considered, oh, this is a man who knows how to dress himself. This is a person who knows how to dress themselves. This is what stylish people wear if they are looking to achieve a sort of understated elegance or not understated. I mean, Billy Porter and Oscar Wilde are two examples, um, both contemporary and not, of people who took Bo Brummel's uh, general thesis and absolutely ran with it, uh, but still con uh, conforming to that. Well, this is a tailored look. This is not what everybody else is wearing, and it's certainly not knee breach. So what were some of the politics of the dandies? Well, Bo Brummel was middle class. Um, he was born into a family with some decent standing, but he was by no means an aristocrat. There's a, like, he had to join the military. It was not uh, a prestige appointment. Uh, looking both at, you know, sort of the macaronis and the dandies, a lot of them were middle class attempting to dress aristocratically. And this includes Bob Rummel. They were trying to achieve the appearance of a certain echelon and the politics were, uh, you know, were very bourgeois. I mean, not for nothing going back to the macaronis and specifically American colonials, uh, not for nothing did the constitution uh, still permit the owning of slaves and uh, decide that, you know, those who could vote were property holders. This was not about a liberation politics. This was about achieving a, a social position that had previously been denied them. It, it, it was very much a politics of social ascent at this point, or at least the appearance of it. And in Bob Rummel's case, you know, that was also true, even though he had no formal appointment um, in the sense of, uh, you know, he, he was friends with the Prince of Wales, but that was short lived. And that was sort of what he achieved in his lifetime as a, as a social position was the prince's friend for a bit. Um, it's it's not as radical a politics as I as I was expecting to, to find. Um, let me go ahead and advance in my notes here because I'm still on Bo Brummel. Sure. Um, there we go. But then uh, Baudelaire talks about uh, the metaphysical uh, phase of dandyism. And for all the fact that most of the well-known dandies, most of the people that we would associate with that movement uh, were middle class or even aristocratic. Um, Baudelaire had this to say, uh, the, uh, the goal, the, the, the mere existence of the dandy is sort of uh, upending the responsible middle class. Um, the uh, idea that good stable citizens should be utterly shocked by this creature uh, in certain respects, uh, dandyism comes close to spirituality and stoicism. These beings have no other status, uh, but that of cultivating the idea of beauty in their own persons, of satisfying their passions, of feeling and thinking. Dandyism is a form of romanticism, contrary to what many thoughtless people seem to believe. Uh, dandyism is not even an excessive delight in clothes and material elegance. For the uh, perfect dandy, these things are no more than the symbol of the aristocratic superiority of the mind. Um, Given its linkage uh, with sort of the Enlightenment movement, 
and the fact that enlightenment cultures, uh, France and the United States in particular, uh, relied so heavily on both uh, the dandy pejorative as sort of reclaimed identity, as well as the thought of the enlightenment. It's interesting that in England specifically, dandyism was almost a revolt against uh, egalitarian thought. It's like, no, we are setting ourselves apart from the common man. We don't dress like these impoverished soldiers and we're telling the upper class what to do. We are an emergent middle class, but not of it, if that makes sense. Um, we're not here to uh, assuage you that this enlightenment thought that's sweeping Europe uh, isn't going to affect this country. If anything, it is going to affect it, and we're going to affect it in this thought by really entrenching it further with this specific uniform. Yeah, and so, you know, in general, Romanticism was opposed to Enlightenment thought and mm -hmm. the overemphasis on rationality. Mm -hmm. uh, romanticism embraced nature and... Uh, but also some of the ancient aristocratic values, even though it wasn't born of the aristocracy. And yeah, Baudelaire, you mentioned, was very much uh, disgusted by the bourgeoisie, middle class society, and um, asserted individualism in that way. There is the other side of Romanticism, though, that was... Uh, the early formation of nationalisms, mm -hmm. which you see in like the Brothers Grimm fairy tales and, mm -hmm. and for German romanticism and all sorts of that stuff. And it sounds like some of that carries over into the dandy, into the dandies. Quite so. Uh, again, especially through that very English lens as, um, as a mode of critique, but even those that were delighted with their own Englishness, there still was this, no, no, this is how it is done. And if it is not done to this code, it's not only wrong, it's an affront to this specific, uh, to this specific time and place. Um, I'm a fancy patriot, for lack of a better term. Um, I don't know if that's a, a crass oversimplification, but it was. It was very much rooted in a new Britain, um, a new America, a new France. Um, and going into the romantics, uh, I'm glad you touched on the Brothers Grimm. Um, German music also saw a nationalist revival of the romantic uh, of the romantic taste. Um, obviously, Wagner. Uh, Scotland begins to produce some of its most uh, revered poets, um, but that's a different sort of nationalism. It's one of the dispossessed, which is really interesting because at that time they were still. I mean, they still are. Um, Scotland is now only a few centuries into its rule by England, and Robert Burns, uh, among others, begin to uh, sort of grieve that ownership, that disenfranchisement of their, uh, you know, their, their lack of sovereignty. Um, French nationalism gets very interesting in the Romantic period uh, because it both adores Shakespeare, but then also accuses him of being an assassin. Um, I think, let me, let me find my, my note here. There's a really great quote about French. Ah, uh, yes. Um, one theater goer in 1822 lamented that Shakespeare was Wellington's aide de camp. So, uh, uh, Shakespeare was, uh, Shakespeare was uh, France's was was the uh, theatrical equivalent of Waterloo. We have been devastated by the love of this British man. He is conquering us, and it's not acceptable. But um, yeah, it's really interesting. In the Romantic period, you do see uh, just an absolute explosion of nationalist writing and theater. Uh, Alexandre Dumas and uh, Victor Hugo write odes to French history. Some, you know you know, more obviously propaganda than others. They were definitely critiques, but they were also hopeful about what France was. They were very much about the goodness of France as well as injustice. Um, all of the art and all of romanticism 
was rooted in these stirring scenes, these gripping passions. And it's not easy to, or it's not difficult to see, especially in this day and age, how uh, fanning the flames of emotion can lead entire countries to some pretty intense nationalistic displays. Recent right. political elections come to mind. So we, before we move away uh, into like uh, Oscar Wilde, mm-hmm. did you come across anything in your research about the Marquis de Sade? You know, actually I didn't. Um, so if you have some insight, definitely share it um, because this is a, an interesting uh, intersection I had not discovered. Well, so uh, it's, I don't know how much of an intersection it was, but preceding that period, you know, de Sade spent his life in and out of insane asylums during the French terror and Mm -hmm. revolution and uh, was considered by some to be a romantic himself, very anti-rational, very, he believed in like a, uh, you know, a deterministic kind of naturalism, almost like, uh, you know, he accepted violence and murder and crime as just being a part of nature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at Baudelaire, uh, you get some of that same celebration of these um, darker aspects of humanity. So I didn't know if how much that carried into the rest of dandyism uh, or if it was more of just like a French uh, fascination. I think that that darkness um, definitely permeates all of the uh, dandies who might also be considered romantics. I mean, you look at uh, Percy and Mary Shelley, you look at their friend Byron. Um, these people were consumed by death, uh, consumed by the darker passions of humanity. And the real, and I say this, you know, lowercase r, uh, the romance inherent in these things to consider death and to consider the perversity of nature is still to glory in nature. Uh, just to understand it through a different lens. Um, I don't think that you can get much more capital R romantic than, you know, Byron taking nationalism in a different direction, uh, joining the Greek war for independence uh, and, you know, posing in, for portraits in these very elaborate turban caps and uh, silks and damasks, um, this national dress and then dying overseas in a war for independence. Um, you know, the romantics were definitely like in a general sense concerned with individual liberty and the presentation of the individual. Um, you know, it is a sin to be inauthentic. Um, and yeah, that's fairly accurate. Why, why not live yourself to the hilt? Um, so it's interesting that something that valued this individual liberty, uh, so aggressively would also become, uh, sort of a, uh, an ornament to fascism, to nationalism, to these things that come a little bit later, but, um, certainly that darkness, uh, that fascination with death, the grim is still, you know, intrinsic to, to love. I mean, to love is to grieve is the, is the notion or uh, grief is love with nowhere to go. There's, there's so many different uh, bon mots or platitudes or what have you about the relationship. So yeah, it wasn't strictly a, fen- a French fascination, although aside from the Russians, I would say that the French writers do it better than anyone in that period. Um, with so- I was going to say with British uh, romanticism, you see it a lot more in their paintings, like with J.M.W. Turner. Um, the writing gets a little florid, apart from the Shelleys and Byron, among others. But um, visually, Britain had a lot of very dark, dark artists uh, painting at the time, painting and sketching. French writers, yes, that darkness was very, very intrinsic. That was a very dandy, romantic facet so um and is there was there any kind of russian dandyism 
Yes and no. I was able to find a little bit of information. Um, this period is still kind of coming out of what is effectively, you know, for the rest of Europe, the Middle Ages. Um, the uh, Romanovs have only just taken power and their modernizers really haven't been installed yet. Um, I think the first Romanov was in the 1790s and this was to settle again a medieval inheritance issue um so it doesn't look the same in russia it looks very very different from the rest of europe at this time um but a key uh, a key romanticist in russia was uh oh, hi sadie alexander pushkin he is the poet of russia um He's got some notable some notable novels in addition to his poetry. Um, Ruslan and Ludmila, uh, The Prisoner of the Caucasus. He was highly influential, considering, you know, sort of the dearth of Russian romantics. Uh, so, I mean, you've you've gotten Peter the Great, you've gotten Catherine the Great. Um, their ten years were definitely really uh really baroque uh and they were lengthy those were two of the principal modernizers um but this is still a fairly new monarchy and they're trying to enact a major cultural shift from a primarily agrarian medieval situation so the aristocrats all look very french all look very british they're trying to emulate this to become a major player on the world stage but um there are Russian romantic writers, but you don't really get a sense of the specific dandy aesthetic. Uh, you get that, you get that grimness, you get the, the problems of, of decadence, but it's still fairly new. So it doesn't emerge in the same way. Um, you get critiques later with uh, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, among others, um, Anna Karenina being a notable, uh, uh, indictment of decadence um, and why it's so bad, why agrarianism really is what Russia should be doing, what people should be doing. Um, but that comes much later in the 19th century. Pushkin was in the early part, uh, you know, 18 in the 1820s, 1830s. So it doesn't have the same kind of influence at the same time. Yeah. Which makes sense. Um, so uh, I want to go in the direction of Oscar Wilde next, but um, how do you, to get there, how do you think that capitalism ties into this and the emerging bourgeoisie in the ability for non-aristocrats, non-nobles to even pursue this kind of a, a mindset? Okay, um, that is a fantastic question. The Industrial Revolution and making new textiles so much more accessible was a big issue. Uh, improved literacy rates uh, in in these countries is also a huge deal. Uh, you know, not for nothing is the printing press the great equalizer. <sighs> That's not what I want to say. That's not right. Not. When the printing press was invented, people were concerned that it would destroy class society. And to a certain extent, it definitely helped level things um, right. in the same way that the Internet is seen as a, a kind of technological anarchy today. Um, and out of the printing press is partially what spawned nationalism as well. There is mm -hmm. some uh it's one of the main theories on where nationalism even comes from is the printing press made it possible for um identity to start becoming uh coagulated into these large national groups versus mm -hmm. what it had been before which is these little towns and whatever villages mm -hmm. so where were we industrial uh, capitalism yeah, how capitalism kind of led to the 
the uh, dandy that we know today, uh, what we associate with Oscar Wilde, how it got away from the bourgeoisie. And um, in truth, it kind of didn't. Um, even in countries that espoused enlightenment values and wanted a more egalitarian society in theory, um, I mean, Spain's dandies, uh, they adopted the dress of the lower classes. They were called mojos, um, espousing the same perspectives of presentation and elaborateness uh, and you know personal decadence as dandies in other countries, but still uh, dressing, dressing down, um, kind of taking it in the opposite direction. And even female dandies in the uh, late 18th, early 19th centuries were called quaintrelles. Um, quaint at that time meant uh, refined, but obviously it's completely uh, shifted. And these quaintrelles, part of, I think, the shift in that definition has come from the fact that they uh, they would sort of emulate the lower classes as sort of a dress-up game. Um, I don't know that we would necessarily call Marie Antoinette a notable dandy, but uh, there's an interesting example with her Petit Trianon, uh, where she and her friends would dress up as farmers and milk goats and do sketching in this little playhouse village of a romanticized pastoral notion of of the agrarian lifestyle that was definitely a precursor to their downfall. Um, and then you get uh, cheaper textiles, you get higher literacy rates um, as a result of some of these enlightenment ideals moving into the new century. And so more people are reading these ideas. Uh, a better educated workforce means that there's uh, more tasks uh, that could be done by somebody who may have only been herding sheep in Yorkshire for 30 years or however. Um, and with all of this new machinery requires the know-how to fix it, to run it, to uh, oversee the production of their components. Uh, so entirely new uh, employment sectors were invented. So all of a sudden, uh, you're making more goods, you're selling more goods, and you're employing people to uh, to create the things that make those items. And they're, you know, the Industrial Revolution, not inaccurately named. There's an explosion of wealth. There's a new middle class. Um, and this emergent middle class can still be... Uh, still be very much noted for its uh, its interest in affecting the manners and the behaviors of uh, the upper echelons of uh, uh, not necessarily playing dress up, but of so a, a certain level of social climbing. And both for those that wanted to achieve that as you know ordinary members of society, and those who wish to kind of turn it on its head, this becomes much more possible because a greater variety of colors and textures was available, uh, were available, excuse me, and sumptuary laws uh, begin to get repealed. Laws that dictate who could wear what fabric and what color are no longer seen as necessary, even as more people can afford to dress in them. They were seen as, as outdated and, and fairly pointless. Um, you can't, can't stop the future. Um, how that gets into... Oscar Wilde, I mean, he was, he was born into an upper, you know, upper class family. He came from wealth. His, his parents were professionals and they ran salon where medical professionals, writers of the day had a, a social circle. So he grew up around this. Um, this was not new to him. He didn't jump into it uh, the way that Bo Brummel did. Um, but he was very much, you know, being in the later 19th century, he was very much a product of this industrial revolution, uh, both for his parents having access to uh, the social circles that they did. I um, get to my my notes here. I have an awful lot on Polish nationalism. Um, um, I mean, his his mother 
was, um, you know, a niece of a famous playwright. His father was a doctor. There was no way he's, he was not going to turn out um, dandified in some capacity, I think. Um, but the extent to which he really embraced it and made it his his self or it felt that it was his self. Um, definitely he, he upped the ante on dandyism for sure. So if you ask any anarchist who has any sort of um, notion of what a dandy is, that's a me Oscar Wilde is who they're going to turn to, especially because, oh, yeah, you know, he wrote the essay, the soul of man under socialism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, why, why don't you go ahead and sort of explain that take, uh, sort of like the aesthetic creative rebellion against capitalism that he launched versus some of the more labor heavy, whatever. Okay. Um, he was definitely an aesthetic, uh, art for art's sake. Um, he, uh, he's famous for having said he could not live up to his blue China. Uh, and he did indeed spend wildly. Um, he and his wife and later his lovers. Um, but he was always very, always very alert to his contemporaries, uh, John Ruskin notable among them, who were obsessed with the idea that art should have a purpose, like a moralizing function in society. And, um, he even, uh, Oscar Wilde even tried to join the Catholic church with the intention of becoming a priest at one point. Um, but he was fundamentally an individualist at his core. And so as much as he, I think, in, appreciated the pageantry and the ritual and, you know, some of the true aesthetic beauty of, uh, of the Catholic churches of the, mon or of the cathedrals, stained glass, um, Things that trying to say this without sounding like I'm uh, proselytizing for Catholicism. Um, he was, uh, in his own words, a bad boy. Um, he could love the beauty and the ritual, the pageantry, but the same regimental the fastidiousness that he appreciated was also just utterly inimical to who he was and could be. Um, he grew up knowing the classics and quoting Shakespeare. Um, not for nothing was he the sole signatory, uh, signatory of George Bernard Shaw's petition to pardon the Haymarket Square's anarchists. Um, he was as comfortable in velvet drawing rooms as he was with miners in Colorado when he was on his U S tour. Uh, and following his stint in prison, um, upon the publication of Reading jail, he asked that it be published in a specific newspaper that he from experience knew was primarily read by the criminal class. Um, and he said that he enjoyed the experience of finally being read by those of his own class. Um, as sort of a fuck you to the aristocrats who uh, were there for him when he was riding high and critiquing uh, society's manners, but who for their own reasons, for the social um, attitudes at the time, um, you know, once he became convicted of being gay uh, or queer, um, you know, he may have been bisexual. It's hard to say that he was any one thing or the other, but he was definitely queer. Um, that uh, he was he was shunned by the people whose society enjoyed him when it was convenient. Um, but uh, upon you know his upon his time in prison, he actually writes in uh, De Profundis, which was published posthumously. I'm trying to get to the quote here. It's very beautiful. Um, when I was first put into prison, some people advised me to try and forget who I was. It was ruinous advice. It is only by realizing what I am that I have found comfort of any kind. 
To regret one's own experiences is to rest one's own development. To deny one's own experiences is to put a lie into the lips of one's own life. It is no less than a denial of the soul. And I think that that speaks um, aggressively to uh, anarchist perspectives. Um, the absolute necessity of a liberation of the self as wider liberation for others. Um, if you are lying to yourself, how can you possibly hope for anybody else to, to fully live truly? Um, he was absolutely a, a bit of a paradox. Um, he uh, stood in symbolic relations to the art and culture of his age, and so, so much of that was in opposition to it, at first cheeky, but by turns, as his situations grew more serious, much more subversively, especially as he began to live much more openly um, as a giant queer man. I mean, he was a very noticeable man, and I think that that is also very much where some of his attitudes come from. I know that sounds like a strange thing, but the, the gentleman was six foot six in an era where the average height for a, uh, a man was five, seven. Um, so he, you know, I appreciate about him. Um, if I'm going to stand out by God, you're going to notice me the way that I like on my own terms. And I think that there's a lot of, uh, a lot to be said in the same in the same anarchist sensibilities. Um, capitalism brought him the ability to maintain this decadent lifestyle, but it was very much as much as like, it, it was as much his downfall as it was his aid. Um, because as soon as the taste of the consumers, the, the wider public, um, you know, turned from, uh, turned from him, he too, like Bo Brummel, uh, like Byron uh, died shabby and insane in a foreign country. Um, you know, there's the famous line about him, uh, you know, the wallpaper goes or I do. And those weren't his last words. Um, his last words were some quasi incoherent ruminations on being accepted into the Catholic faith on his deathbed. Um, but he did, you know, he did have the war of the wallpaper uh, in a letter to a friend and so, you know, right to the end, he was very much about this, you know, this colorful, nonsensical consumer culture while still positing himself in opposition to it. Um, was any of that coherent? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, one of the one of the points he makes is that there's a sort of conformity that goes along with consumer society, which, um, you know, a lot of libertarian capitalist types would try to uh you know they say that capitalism is all about individuals and individuality you even hear socialists say this but when you actually look at how it manifests it, it, it actually results in a very conformist culture mm -hmm. where because you're being dictated by the lowest common denominator in a lot of cases you wind up uh having to live your life by appealing to the least uh, sophisticated forms of culture out there. So I was just wondering about that. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, as far as, you know, I know you're familiar with this band and um, it's also part of what my inspiration has been, the band World Inferno Friendship Society and Jack Terrycloth. Mm -hmm. So between, <laughs> between the time of uh, Oscar Wilde and Jack Terry Cloth. What were some of the developments that happened? Um, I think that the main one is a much greater openness to queer identities. Uh, Edward Gorey kind of comes to mind as a midpoint. Um, another giant of a man who wore elaborate fur coats, loved cats, um, Probably gay, but also is famous for saying, I don't necessarily think I'm any one thing or the other. But uh, he's got a phrase that sort of sums up dandyism for me, especially in the mid-century. Oh, the of it all. Um, just whatever fits in there. But I can just imagine Edward Gorey. <laughs> the of it all. That's, that's an entire 
that's an entire thesis statement. And the man, if you look at his artwork, heavily influenced by, um, you know, definitely God, what's the illustrator's name. I am totally blanking. Aubrey Beardsley. You look at Aubrey Beardsley's art. You look at uh, Gory's uh, theater work for Dracula in the 70s. Um, so he's kind of the midpoint between Jack Terry cloth and uh, Oscar Wilde. There's definitely a link with the, the darkness of uh, of the human soul, as well as the beauty of it and the sheer absurdity. Um, slight like around the time of Oscar Wilde in the United States, um, they didn't really have the dandy. We had the dude. And in uh, 1883, there's just a really great newspaper article from the Chicago Tribune the genus dude in all of his manifestations of gorgeous idiocy. And I'm sort of in love with that headline as an archetype of dandyism um, outside of Oscar Wilde and sort of bridging uh, across, across geographical bar barriers and into the present day. Um, I really appreciate in that context that we still use dude as a general term of personhood. Um, gorgeous idiocy, I think is a really great, uh, a really a, a really great explanation or a quick idiom uh, for certain aspects of dandyism. Again, going back to the absurdity, like, ah, oh, yes, this is nonsense, and it's glorious. Um, going into the 20s, going into the 30s, you have Dolly, the contemporary dandy, with his elaborate mustache and dreamlike paintings. Um, again, another example of... Uh, the sort of Danny nationalism, right? Um, yeah, you know, as a futurist, kind of stripped away from the romantics, but as, uh, clinging aggressively to those same nationalistic roots with probably the best intentions. I love Dolly, but he's a complicated critter. Uh, you've got Fitzgerald uh, and his notably not dandy uh, bestie. Uh, Hemingway, but you've got James Joyce, uh, you've got uh, Gladys Bentley, you've got you know pretty much every jazz musician, um, particularly black jazz musicians in the 20s and 30s, uh, escalating this aesthetic, and it is very dandified at a time when people were coming back from war and there was rationing artists of all types uh, from all backgrounds we're really dressing to the nines as an assertion of the self. It's uh, not just a rejection of Victorian moralizing and uh, Edwardian secrecy. It's also very much um, an assertion of, you know, the, the, the utter significance of the self in spite of hegemony. Um, so I think the twenties are a prime dandy years. You look at Theta Barra, um, in the movies, um, Mamie, Mamie Smith, Bessie Smith, any of the great jazz queens, any of the great screen silence, Rudolph Valentino, peak dandy. And again, the same arguments, uh, the same critiques, the same insults were lobbed at him as were in revolutionary England. Oh, what a total macaroni. This is an effeminate, exotic Italian man who might be gay. He was called, you know, Rudolph Vasilino or a powder puff um, as, you know, because he threatened the masculinity of Anglo-American society simply by being foreign and attractive. Uh, and, oh, our women are really into this. That's, that's not okay. This is, this is obviously this man is queer because um, he doesn't look like what we associate with rugged masculinity but women are reacting to it. Um, he's definitely a bridge uh, in that link. All of Hollywood culture, I would say, was. You know, it was an early, it was an art colony. You cannot have art colonies without dandies. It's uh, yeah territory. Um, what about Fred Astaire? Would you put him in the dandy, can, the, uh, dandy category? That's a great question. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, I think probably before he was famous for his screen comedies with Ginger Rogers. Um, I mean, uh, his sister Adele, I think, Adele Astaire, uh, when they were doing their 
vaudeville circuit. I, uh, and when his performances necessarily had to be mu- that much more elaborate to gain uh, attention. And also because they were just so much less, they were a lot less propaganda uh, than the uh, screen comedies with Ginger Rogers. Um, so I think there was a point at which Fred Astaire was a dandy, but then he sort of bought in. Never accused Fred Astaire of being a sellout, but he did buy in. Yeah. Um, any relationship with Dada? The Dadaists? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a great group of, of nonsensical artists uh, commenting on the, the absurd, capital A. Um, Again, linking back to Salvador Dali, um, you know, maybe not the uh, the famous installation of the toilet, but um, I think that dandyism would absolutely appreciate the commentary there and the idea of breaking away from established modes of expression, breaking away from, you know, as with Beau Brummel and the uh, knee breaches, moving away from a specific style of expression, what was acceptable in painting and sculpture and an exploration of the self having come out of a truly horrific war that really did make uh, people question um, literally everything. Like this is a joyous existentialism and why not live to the nines, especially given that prohibition is illegal in the United States at this time. All righty. Um, I think that, you know, especially since that you see Dada influences in fashion, like, um, Salvador Dali, notable for his, uh, uh, work with Scaparelli, um, among others, uh, he had a huge influence on fashion and the dandy motto, uh, from Oscar Wilde. Uh, One should either be a work of art or wear a work of art. And in many respects, the interwar dandies said, well, fuck it. Why not both? Um, You know, you see really amazing things coming out of uh, fashion. You've got the pre-Raphaelites. You've got experiments with shape, with color, with textile. Again, very much uh, a facet of that accessibility from the industrial revolution, but you've got people playing with not wearing the same shape corset with not wearing, uh, you know, the same two colors working class and middle-class people could now afford a lot of interesting things. And that meant that the Bohemians, the fringes of society could also afford those things to play around with them. And indeed they did. Um, Gertrude Stein was uh, notable for her particular aesthetic. You've got George Sand, um, who dressed fairly masculine throughout her life, um, even as Baudelaire decried her as a, uh, a useless slut. His, his critique of George Sand was like, ah, yes, nice to see that the uh, romantics and the dandies are uh, really, really leaning into that whole reactionary thing that they, uh, incidentally claim to be against right um like oh it's uh it's great that we've got this homoerotic subtext could you maybe dial down the misogyny no no they could not yeah unfortunately and uh yeah um so we'll get to that kind of i'll i have something to say about that because in the 80s uh you know the just briefly say the uh, um, glam rock Mm -hmm. phenomenon was not the most uh, sexist free. (laughs) No, which is interesting because it was a much more open space for queerness. So even in this very queer identified, the new romantics, you've got Mark Bolan, you've got Adam Ant, you've got Boy George, you've got David Bowie, you've, got openly queer individuals or gender non-conforming individuals people who play up to an androgyny or to a hyper femininity um and just experiment with 
what has historically not been hegemonic, hegemonic masculinity. Um, and it still is, you still get the groupie subculture. David right. Bowie fucked teenagers. And you see uh, in uh, feminist yeah. literature, there is quite a bit of criticism of that whole phenomenon as being mm -hmm. a, uh, you know, a very masculine um, sort of like uh, glorification of the feminine mystique or what have you. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's drag without introspection. Mm -hmm. And even today in queer spaces, misogyny <laughs> against, again, like, the, I think, and this is something that I see going through all of the dandy uh, incarnations, the libertines, the macaronis, the romantics, uh, up through the present. There's only so much hegemony one is willing to cede as an individual and as a uh, as a movement, and it's very easy uh, among you know historically easy targets uh, to pick and choose where uh, where privilege might best be lobbed against still further marginalized groups. So, yes, uh, cis white gay men or cis white gender uh gender queer there is really no good way to say this without immediately opening myself up to uh what about ism i'm not trying to pull any gotchas um but yes uh even as the exploration of gender uh presentation uh, occurred in the new romantic style in the glam rock era uh even with men who were, you know, gender nonconforming, um, so people who were gender nonconforming, but presented as male outside of or masculine outside of their performances, um, bisexual men like David Bowie, you still have this specific misogyny of, you know, groupie culture of. I am the best of uh, hegemonic masculinity uh, defined by degradation of any gender that wasn't their own or of uh, by claiming the privileges of especially white masculinity and everything that that entails to the point of predation. So yep. getting the benefits of that masculinity while still transgressing it um, as long as it didn't affect record sales. Yep. Yeah. And that's definitely a, one of the strong critiques of dandyism, uh, mm -hmm. new romanticism all the way up to the present. So let's, um, did anything happen during World War II to just totally decimate any uh, imagination that was possible in the Cold War? I mean, during the Cold War, you, of course, have the new romantics and the glam rockers. In the 40s, the real... Um, dandyism was not a driving force of the cultural aesthetic. You still have your jaded post-war writers. You still have a support for the individual, but you go from world war two and allying against fascism, uh, ostensibly and imperialism to immediately diving in to the red scare. So the right. red scare really decimates a lot of what would have been the dandy class uh, outside of Hollywood and outside of New York city and other, you know, bohemian enclaves, other, other art colonies. I, I, I suppose it's a little bit quaint to call New York city, a, an artist colony, but uh, Greenwich village had a thriving queer culture, but you see very muted sweaters. You see an embrace of rebellious denim of dressing down 
um, you know, the big to do in World War II era uh, Hollywood was women adopting trousers. That was a huge deal. We take it for granted today, but I think even in Tucson, there's still a law that women are not allowed to wear pants. It is against the law for women to wear pants. I don't think it's ever been repealed. It's just not enforced. But um, so aside from where art typically was made at those times, I mean, the aspiring poet in Nebraska was still probably wearing a wool skirt um, or the standard high school suit. Even as they read, you know, lesbian pulp fiction, they were looking the part. So dandyism definitely sees a downturn at that point uh, for fear of very real consequences from anything that wasn't, you know, white capitalist Christianity. Um, God blowing your nose the wrong way could be seen as a sign of communism. It was the specter was everywhere. And uh the United States did not disappoint on that front. <laughs> I can't hear you again. It cut out again. I didn't hear anything that you said. So that was a dark period for interesting things. And uh, yes. But then we got, you know, the 60s and mm -hmm. psychedelia and uh, the counterculture. And I guess to, I mean, basically from then to now would be, well, maybe not now, maybe like 20 years ago, but, um, I would say that's a solid period to talk about what might be considered dandyism in our times. Oh, absolutely. Um, in the sixties, you see the blend of hippie and mod, particularly in, uh, you know, London's Carnaby street. Uh, you look at the aesthetics of Jimi Hendrix with the uh, the many lace cravats with the colors, the paisley, the the vests, um, beads being everywhere. Um, and even in the places that could be lived in, you know, San Francisco's iconic painted ladies, the Victorian houses, the Grateful Dead had one of those and it came dirt cheap because it was 100 years old. And now they sell for the millions. Um, but even is a, an architectural expression of, uh, you know, of the dandy aesthetic. A lot of it comes from what people could afford while taking gig employment in San Francisco. Um, sorry, I'm a little minutely distracted. Um, and again, uh, looking at, at Adam Ant, looking at uh, your goth rockers like Susie Sue. Um, and I think even to an extent, in a weird way, um, you know, the 80s slut chic of Madonna, there's still all of this black lace. There's still all of these beads. There's still elaborate makeup and hair. And it's very, you know, counter to what straight society is attempting to look like. Um, sort of a, a yuppie, uh, a yuppie counterpart, and I think one that, you know, if one that Oscar Wilde wouldn't adopt, certainly one that he would appreciate for its spirit. Yeah, so let's talk, uh, let's uh, make a last note talking mm -hmm. about our own lifetimes, which uh, I think you're, you're around my age, I think. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I know I missed a lot of the 80s. You know, I was like, yeah, I got the tail end. <laughs> and so, you know, growing up in the nineties and really becoming culturally aware in the early two thousands, what I wound up finding my way into was world Inferno friendship society, mm -hmm. who I mentioned earlier and Jack Terry cloth in particular, which brings us all back to square one. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about them and just uh, what, since uh, since we were born, what dandyism has looked like in our lifetime? Uh, um, I definitely think that uh, it's 
continued to get queerer and darker. Um, definitely like taking the best of the romantics with the best of the dandies, um, as well as, you know, that socio-political critique, um, not for nothing are klezmer, uh, and, uh, sort of Baroque punk bands, uh, as popular as they've ever been. Um, and looking at a, uh, at a markedly different society than the one that, uh, maybe I'm used to having grown up in, in the nineties. Um, I think that those extremes are going to get more pronounced. I'm really excited to see how extravagant, uh, that, that aesthetic manifests, um, as an expression of those, as an expression of, uh, those critiques or those rejections. Um, Jack was a huge loss. He definitely embodied the soul of dandyism. Um, the first world Inferno friendship song, uh, that I ever heard, I was 15 and it was on a mix, um, from fat wreck and it wasn't one of their most baroque pieces it's actually the, a pretty middling song and i put it away and never gave it a thought and then when i moved up to phoenix in 2011 um i joined the brass lung the, the marching band that, that played at all the protests um <laughs> okay and through that actually had the opportunity to open for World Inferno Friendship Society at a show. Um, and just the sheer presence of this man, the, uh, the wry wit, the excellent banter, and God, the perfection of his self-presentation. That shit was crisp. The man could dress. Yep. And he was able to uh, combine that with all of the things that I was thinking and feeling at the time and many of the things that I do, uh, do still think and feel. I, he, like uh, Wilde and others before him, understood that it is, you know, it's possible to have your bread and roses too. You can, you can want, th the point of a revolution is to make life better. We're not supposed to be sacrifices to any idea. We're supposed to survive. That's, that's sort of the point, not just survive, but thrive. And if thriving should have some velvet to it, it should have some, some joy and yes, it should be lavish. You know, like uh, there's the, uh, the apocryphal quote of Emma Goldman's, if I can't dance, it's not my revolution. I think that's a really great ex uh, uh, explanation of the radical dandy notion that Jack understood, especially um, yes, Yes, I do want the world to be better, and I'm willing to fight for it. But if I cannot dance, then what's the goddamn point? And, and for any for anybody that's not like familiar with this band, mm -hmm. um, they're I mean they're more or less an anarchist band. They have they write mm -hmm. anarchist songs. They uh, I don't I don't know what the political makeup of each member is, but they um, they combine like all the cool shit that I ever thought was cool witchcraft like dandyism anarchism good music uh partying having fun one of my favorite lines from a song is that the socialists are so boring yeah oh I yeah. love that song yeah. yes uh, it's a German title yeah song. it's a very long it. reference to the Weimar Republic <laughs> right but yes yeah, socialists are so boring um Oh God, that whole song is so goddamn good. And the, the summoning of the spirit of Sally Bowles, like, yes, that is a great, a great look at the juxtaposition between like, ah, yes, the, the pragmatic realities of being alive, as well as the joy and the hope inherent in a certain, a certain artistic uh, pursuit, coupled with the ever looming specter of fascism yep so uh him summoning that was a little evergreen uh 
Yeah, and he was just an amazing lyric writer and everything else as well. And just a kind person. Yeah. For somebody who has very little musical ability (laughs) and a great deal of social anxiety, um, being able to uh, be not just at a show of his, but to actively be participating in it and to have that kind of encouragement um, means the world to me still. And that was one of the hardest deaths. That's one that I still grieve because, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't just Jack Terry cloth. He was Pete and he loved to live deliciously. Um, You know, I think another key track that I would highlight uh, is it looks like blood, but it's probably wine. And then you get a lot of the uh, dark romantic uh, interwar references in uh, the apple was Eve. That's another one that I would point out for, you know, anybody interested in his sort of dandy thesis on anarchism, uh, as well as just an utterly moving song. So <clears throat> I know we could probably do a whole episode just on that band, but Absolutely. what do you what do you think is going on today now with anarchists, with culture in general? I mean, there is, you know, there is definitely stage uh um dandyism i guess but i don't you know i feel like when i walk around or look around at the way people are dressing or the way that subculture uh doesn't feel like it has a presence like it used to only 15 20 years ago and i don't know if that's just me or if that's something that you've experienced as well but i mean even even in the places you would expect to see uh, an embrace of fashion and a uh, an engagement with these historical traditions of iconoclasm, for lack of a better word, you don't. You, uh, at least I don't. I think that given that we are in sort of an economic and geopolitical situation akin to the run-up to World War II. Um, Widespread economic devastation. People are fucking broke. Uh, Well, most people. And the disparity is massive. There's the looming specter of international war literally daily. I'm kind of just waiting for the headline on CNN to say world war three has started. Um, the missiles landing in Poland the other day and killing those farmers was something that kind of had my, my senses tingling as it were. Um, because it's not going to stop, uh, at Ukraine. Um, and the escalating tensions between China, Japan, and the Koreas, all of, this is going to boil over in our lifetimes. Um, That coupled with very extreme polarization of the two parties in the United States. um, I think we're seeing a lot of that proto red scare um, need to conform to survive again, apart from places where, you know, art lives and thrives in places where it always has. Um, But again, with that disparity, that's increasingly the privilege of, of the people that were born into it um, or who maybe made a billion on crypto and had the nows to sell before somebody right clicked their board ape. Um, I think that probably in our lifetimes within like within the next 10 to 20 years, we're probably going to see, the more extravagant modes of expression return as a a sort of aesthetic catharsis. But I don't think that that's going to come until after a truly catastrophic, um, more widespread international incident. Um, Right now we're in the nostrums, uh, not nostrums, but normalcy phase, uh, particularly with Biden as president, like everything is like, can we please just fucking hold this together? Can we just abide for a minute? And that's 
not really going to last. It's untenable. And the untenable uh, definitely unleashes that wilder side of expression, but it's, you know, the untenable also unleashes true cruelty. Uh, So, you know, rejecting that cruelty inside and out, the presentation of the self as well as, like, living the self, the liberation of the self, I think is is going to be crucial. Um, I'm trying to make this as, as cogent as possible, but for the moment, I'm I'm only marginally optimistic. You're right; it's it's different. It's very different. I would say even from ten years ago, um, I would still say that ten years ago, the carnival was still going on, and now everybody is just scraping off, scraping by. Um, and I think that we're going to, as we wait for the, as we wait to approach the precipice. Well, <laughs> sorry, that's not the most optimistic, but uh, what can I say? I'm a, a late romantic. That's all right. Um, I think that really sums up a lot of the key points on dandyism and, uh, you know, any, what would you recommend some people read, watch, listen to that we have or haven't talked about already? Um, I would explore kidsofdada.com, um, the works of Edward Gorey for sure, uh, Gladys Bentley, Bessie Smith, um, all the silent film that you can, uh, Theta Barra in particular, um, a goddamn queen. George Sand, uh, anybody participating in the movable feast era, uh, that interwar period where you've got, um, you know, you've got your Fitzgeralds, you've got, you've got Hemingway, you've got Joyce, uh, you've got both Fitzgeralds, frankly, Zelda Fitzgerald deserves more credit than she gets. Um, you get anybody that Gertrude Stein ever, ever touched, um, I would also, you know, recommend the movies of uh, Tilda Swinton uh, and the music of, of Grace Jones and Janelle Monet. Those are some contemporary dandies. Uh, in addition to, um, you know, in addition to Jack Terry Cloth, uh, dandyism is not necessarily just sol- the sole purview of punk. Um, and actually, there was a, uh, a definition that I kind of want to finish with uh, Sophia Wallace. Um, articulating a lot of the things that originated with Bo Brummel, the macaronis, um, that also sort of brings it into a much more contemporary uh, and uh, liberation-oriented uh, a sense of the dandy. So if I could share that with you real quick. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um. The dandy conventionally, oh, excuse me, the dandy conventionally defined as a strikingly attractive man whose dress is immaculate and manner is dignified has been around since the late 18th century. Often misunderstood as superficial, dandyism is a space of creative possibility where individuals can perform a persona beyond the binaries of masculine and feminine and intervene in white supremacist ideas of black subjecthood. Artists like Oscar Wilde, Charles Baudelaire, H. H. Monroe and less recognized women such as Gladys Bentley and uh, Ethel Waters and Romaine Brooks found dandyism to be a liberatory space, not only for appearance, but more importantly, for a life of independence that did not necessarily adhere to a deterministic heterosexual model of marriage and children. And a friend of mine has just handed me a note that also, uh, highlights uh, Arthur Simons of the late 19th century. So I want to give that a shout out. Thank you. Um, examples of modern dandies. This one includes Andy Warhol, although I debate that given his obsession with uh, mass uh, mass production and his extremely monochromatic palette. I, so I dispute that, but this is still a solid definition. Um, Quentin Crisp, uh, Grace Jones, Tilda Swinton, and Janelle Monet, 
The dandy is neither traditionally feminine or masculine. Rather, the dandy is an exquisite sartorial state, which often aestheticizes a refined androgyny, which is broadly available regardless of sex or gender. So I think in many ways it hasn't changed. In many ways it really, really has. And I'd like to just add one more, the controversial Mm -hmm. from just about every political direction, Camille Paglia's book, uh, Sexual Persona, Mm -hmm. is basically a guidebook to androgyny and the history of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, incredible um, depth of... Histor- history in that book, even if the conclusions could be a little weird sometimes. But uh, yeah, so uh, anything that you're doing lately that you want to promote? Um, I'm still working on anti-fascist fashion Eastex. Um, I'm not able to devote as much time to it uh, as I would like. I would like it to expand into essays and conversations like the one that we're having. But um, I am seeking out creators, particularly uh, fashion designers or those who work with textile and jewelry, um, to highlight their projects and their products, um, as well as the things that I'm working on on my own. Um, I just finished this robe that I'm wearing, which is very much, I do love me some Edwardian guilt. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on that. Um, I'm actually working on a lot of baby products right now because everybody that I know has procreated. Um, so I'm trying to make, uh, fun and aesthetically pleasing blankets and toys for awesome babies of awesome people. Uh, and in the meantime, still kind of working that nine to five to keep my cat in her stink cereal. It's uh, not quite the dilettante existence that uh, somebody who sits like this for an interview after work should be uh, should really be living. But um, I do what I can. And yeah, we all have to compromise. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for coming on. I've been really anxious to to have you on the show and to talk about this with you. Oh, uh, I'll put everything that I can <laughs> into the into the show description um Mm -hmm. and yeah um let's say goodbye to everyone and wish them well yeah good luck everyone